My name is Dimitri Broxton. I'm the Senior Director of Education at MOAD, and this is In the Artist Studio. And today we have our guest, Alex Anderson. Um, I'm going to go into a couple of announcements before we jump into this conversation. Uh, and just want to let everyone know to please use that chat, use the Q&A, participate with us. We want to hear from you. So MOAD's physical building is currently closed as we undergo a refresh of our galleries, but you can still get your fill of art and artists of the African diaspora. Twice a month, join my colleague Elena Gross and myself as we visit some of our favorite artists in their studios to see what they're currently working on. This is a rare opportunity to hear from artists directly from their studios. We follow all talks with an audience Q&A. So we invite you to please make sure you put your questions in the Q&A panel if you're on Facebook. If you're joined, I mean, if you're on Zoom, sorry. If you're on Facebook, put them in the chat and we'll get to those as well. Please visit our website to see which artists we have coming up. You can also go back and watch all of our past talks on MOAD's YouTube channel. This series was made possible by a generous donation by the Westridge Foundation all of our MOAD members and all of you who come and support us every single week. Thank you so much. I'm going to read a few statements. MOAD stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. We honor and mourn the senseless murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Dante Wright, Micaiah Bryant, and the countless others who have lost their lives at the hands of police brutality and racial injustice, including those whose names we do not know. Moat's commitment to racial justice is ongoing, and as such, we will continue to say their names and hold space to honor these victims. Next is our land acknowledgement. We remember that all non-Native people to this land are descended from settler occupiers or those who were brought against their will. Moad occupies the unceded land of the Ramatush Ohlone people, and we pay our respects to the Ohlone people and their elders, both past and present. If you would like to know more about the original inhabitants of the land that you live on, we invite you to visit native-land.ca, and we'll also put that in the chat. My guest today, Alex Anderson, received an MFA in ceramics from University of California, Los Angeles, after earning a Fulbright grant in affiliation with the China Academy of Art in Huangzhou in 2015. His work has been exhibited in galleries and institutions internationally and across the United States with an emphasis on Southern California. His recent work explores intersectional themes of Black and Asian American identity through the lens of millennial culture. Anderson is represented by Gavlak Gallery in Los Angeles and Palm Beach. Welcome, Alex. I'm so excited to be talking to you today. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Yes, yes. Um, as I was saying, you know, before we went live with everyone, your art, there, there's a quality to your art that, you know, it's just one of those things that I, I haven't been able to articulate yet. By the end of this conversation, I hope I have more words to put it to put into it, but uh, it, it struck a chord with me immediately, you know, and it, it's it, there, there's some, there's a quality to your art that tells me that there's something else going on and I want to know the narratives, I want to know the stories. And I almost feel kind of innately like I do know them and, and I don't know what it is about your art. So I'm, I'm hoping to peel away those layers so that I can better understand, you know, wh what it is that immediately just strikes a chord with me. Um, but, you know, before we get in that, how are you doing <laughs> and where are you joining us from? I am doing so well. Um, I'm joining you from Los Angeles. I'm in my classroom right now where I teach ceramics. Um, and um, yeah, it's, everything's wonderful. I, that, that idea of not knowing exactly what hits in the work, I think, I mean, I can even start from there a bit. Um, the work that I make, and I know one of your questions is around process, so I won't get too much into that until later, <laughs> right? but um, it is all about the things that I experience socially, um, existentially, culturally. And I think that when we come from similar backgrounds, um, we navigate the white Western power system similarly. And so a lot of the work is about those things. It's about these ideas of what it feels like to um, be the active other, um, what it feels like to um, move through different social situations based on um, you know, how we're um, contextualized by society via our identity politics and um, 
how other people perceive us and choose to interact with us or maybe even control us. So um, those things are very much a part of the work. And um, it's, it's that feeling that I've been trying to capture. I think I see things in the art world sometimes where I'm like, absolutely that, that is it. Without yes, yes. Uh, the language for it. And so yes. you know, one of the things that my professor said in undergrad is, um, art can be about accessing the linguistically inaccessible and you know why why make words for it when you can capture all of it with complex images that say it all oh i love that i love that sentiment yeah and um you know i th i think you know i mean I've, obviously for me we we also kind of like talked about our shared blazian identity and so you know i also just kind of wonder if if that's if if that's a component to you know how how did you know before we even go into that and, and how I think it may be? Um, you know, what role does your personal identity play into the into the work that you make? Like some some artists, I think you can see it. You know, some artists it's 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 not as as prevalent, but I, I think there definitely is a quality to yours that um, that you know it, it 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 like like the word that you said at the beginning it hits it it just hits right away. Um, and so, you know, can you can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. I I think the work is personal, but it's it uses the specific to access the general. Uh, there are these ideas that um, I've had about why the world is the way it is with relation to me, and I I think a lot of it does have to do with my identity politics. When I enter a lot of the spaces that I occupy, which are primarily white spaces. I'm rather immediately aware of my identity. And I, I always have been, even before I was aware of that awareness. You know, you, you kind of feel, um, you feel, you feel the eyes on you or you feel the um, kind of the white discomfort, if you will, around um, what you're wearing, how you're talking, what you're eating, you know, whatever it is. And um, again, that awareness of being the other is something that's always been prevalent in my experience. And so that goes into the work pretty immediately. And so while it is about um, my, personhood and my experience of that personhood, it's, um, I've always said that art is, um, art at large is a series of mosaic tiles where each artist is a tile in a larger mosaic of what the human condition is. That's my one specific position um, as a Blasian gay male millennial. Um, so when you put those identity politics into uh, the work, it's about accessing and um, holding and uh, expressing yourself through that one position um, based on those things that make me who I am. But I think that you know you can access it through e any of those individual identities as a viewer, um, or you can look at it as uh, a, an autobiographical thing that speaks to who I am and what it means to be me or somebody like me. Mm, mm. I love it, I love it. <laughs> can, you know, I also should just back myself up a little bit, you know, this this last, year and a half approximately for, for for folks that has been different it's been a challenging time it's been also you know diff, different artists that, that i've spoken to have have approached this last year and a half in different ways some of them just you know production just stopped you know which i, I know that happened for a lot of people as the world just suddenly shut down um how was that for you how did that impact your work your exhibitions um, you know, and your, even your ability to get into your studio. In LA, the lockdown was, started on March 14th and my second sh solo show last year opened on March 14th. <laughs> oh, no way. No. So, um, it was impactful for sure. However, <laughs> it was actually really beneficial to me um, um, by kind of like a, I don't know, secondary benefit, if you will, um, because the show was then up for five months. And um, that coincided with the civil uprisings that we had. Um, a lot of the, the focus on Black Lives Matter, um, people starting to actually believe that Black Lives Matter, fancy that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and those issues were all in the work. Um, there was one of my favorite quotes about the work is from Justin Camp from Artsy Magazine, who said, Alex Anderson points with derision at the way in which white Western society dresses up its violence and fetishism in white porcelain. And that mm. show was entirely about that. It was called Little Black Boy Makes Imperial Porcelains, about the notion that um, I would, I'm not supposed to be making these things if the white Western paradigm had its way. And um, in that vein, I'm, I'm making these things that are both um, telling them about themselves 
and um, telling them about myself in a way that, you know, when I wasn't supposed to have a voice necessarily. I'm making these delicate, lovely, cute little things, um, but ceramics has a history of a lot of waste, a lot of um, uh, consumption of, of natural resources, and a lot of um, ill-gotten gains in human labor that was mostly grounded in um, racial exploitation, slave labor. So um, when I think about those things, there is something that's a little bit dissonant to me about making art at all, but also um, making ceramics, because it, um, it has such a charged history attached to it. Ooh, ooh, I want to definitely go into that. Um, you know, I think also before we start showing the work, I think just that that history, I, you know, th there's a there's a few artists who have, you know, tackled ceramics and particularly porcelain and imperial, um, you know, the imperial connection to porcelain and, you know, how that comes from China into Europe and, you know, through the rest of the world. Um, you know, I'm thinking of an artist like Levon Bell, who explores the concept of Cheney, you know, these little shards of uh, blue porcelain, the blue wear um, that ended up all over, you know, the beaches <laughs> and the US Virgin Islands um, for one. But, you know, there's not a lot of artists who really go into the history of porcelain and its role. So can you can you talk about that um, before we jump into your work? Absolutely. There's you can maybe I'll have you tell me when to stop because <laughs> it's <laughs> so much to it. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is the fact that porcelain has always been used ceramic vessels and ceramic objects, but generally um, those are made out of porcelain have always been used to express status um, and have all uh, started by expressing status in the palaces of uh, Western European empires, actually Western and Eastern Europe, actually every empire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if we mm -hmm. think about, um, it, it's not just European, it's of course, it's, it's, it's Chinese, it's Korean, um, it's, it's Japanese, but um, given the fact that I'm making work about the Western experience and my Western experience, uh, porcelains in the West were used to express status and the priorities of the ruling class, like all art. But they're so charged with um, with meaning because of the larger exchange of life, <laughs> black lives, for porcelain. One of the things, um, a specific example, my gallerist um, um, showed me, or what we were talking about with relation to this concept, is the fact that slaves were brought from Africa to mine uh, or to, to um, harvest sugar, which was then exchanged for huge amounts of money, which was then exchanged for property and then porcelains that would go mm. in those properties or really those palaces. So we have court porcelains. Court porcelains are um, kind of the, the very tip of that, um, that system of ill-gotten gains where um, it's, this, um, it's this fine, beautiful thing that goes inside of the palace, which is its own fine, beautiful thing. But it's just one of these objects that it continue to express and um, hold the power that, uh, that, that a certain imperial monarch would want to express as part of their regime. And so there was a, a specific statistic that said that every, um, every pound of sugar is a certain number, is a, is, is a, a commensurate with a certain uh, um, measurement of black flesh. And um, thus, porcelain is probably commensurate with a much larger um, uh, uh, handful, if you will, or a measurement of, of black flesh. And so when I think about those things, it's like, well, if, if um, the powers uh, had their, had their uh, way, I would be, you know, um, working in uh, agriculture, we'll say. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but here I am making, you know, thinking about things and making, making objects that relate to those thoughts. They never wanted me to think. They certainly didn't. And they probably, you know, if they had it their way, wouldn't have me thinking and certainly not making mm. things that relate to that. So um, there's always this feeling of getting away with something, but also the feeling of uh, knowing that it's a very rare pri privilege to be somebody with my identity politics and be able to not only express that experience, but be able to have the time, resources and privilege um, to be able to make ceramics. That is that is awesome. And now, you know, kind of thinking about ceramics, how is, is, is that is that something that comes from your 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 family? Like, do you have do you come from generations of um, potters or, you know, like this 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 choice of this specific material? Can you kind of like walk us through the process of, you know, what 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 led you to this and then particularly um, porcelain, you know, this, as 
what you have, you know, behind you in the image is very, very starkly white <laughs> ceramic. So not, you know, not terracotta or or any other thing, but specifically porcelain. Like, what, can you kind of like walk through, you know, have you, did you, did you always know you wanted to play with clay, you know, as, as a, as a very young child or, or how did that come about for you? Nobody, nobody in my family is an artist. Um, they, oh, wow. They're all, um, I mean, a, a range of things that aren't artists. <laughs> um, and they were all really like concerned about me being an artist. Cause I, you know, they're like, what's that? What are you going to do? Like, are we, are you going to be living at home forever? And I'm like, no, <laughs> but <laughs> I'll figure it out. I'm that sweet. But um, my journey in clay started with a high school ceramics class. Uh, we had to take it as an art requirement. And as soon as I saw my uh, teacher make this form on the wheel, I was like, Oh, that, that, that is it. That's it. That's it. Um, wow. I wanted to master the medium from that moment. And I was like, oh, I need to learn how to use this wheel well. I need to learn how to, I, I wanted to learn how to do everything. I, uh, what I, um, I, I wanted to be able to um, have the knowledge to be able to express any idea that I had and um, give, give form to that idea. And um, porcelain has, again, it has that history that we just talked about, but it, it's also, it's so beautiful. It's, um, it's so refined. It's, um, even in its raw state, which I prefer actually without glaze, it's it's like it's like an icy rock crystal, um, but you formed it. Imagine like a polished piece of white quartz that you can make in any form once it's fired. Mm. Beautiful. Um, a common misconception is that my work is porcelain. It's actually white earthenware. Um, and so the um, these forms, things like this, don't do so well, uh, like that, <laughs> don't do so well in the kiln um, at, at at the por temperature of porcelain, but it uses the aesthetic of these of these porcelains. And I've worked in porcelain before. I, when I studied in China, of course, everything was porcelain. Mm -hmm. um, I studied in Jingdezhen, China, where um, one of my professors told me that when she visited, they were doing road work, and when they dug under the black street, it was white, all white porcelain under the. the wow. Street. So, um, it's a magical place where you can learn everything about what clay can accomplish or how you can use it and things that I wasn't even aware of. And that's where a lot of the, the potential of clay um, was revealed to me. Um, and, and just like how finely rendered you can make it or how coarse you can make it, or you know, you can treat it like a painting, you can treat it like, um, like modeling, uh, a, a material for modeling, you can treat it as um, really anything you want. Um, so the work is, is, is all made of a white earthenware, mostly just so that um, I can make things that are complex and uh, have a kind of floating quality without them falling over. <laughs> mm, got it, got it. Okay, so so for those who I am I am not a ceramicist, don't, you know, had to take the basic class, but don't know very much about it. Porcelain is fired at a much higher temperature, right? Yes, 2,500 um, degrees for about 10 hours versus earthenware, which is fired to 1,860 degrees for about six. Okay, got it, got it. And so, and so the difference is with porcelain, you're, are, are you limited with, you know, the, the shapes and I, I guess also kind of the weight of, of the piece as, as opposed to the earthenware? Yeah, um, earthenware shrinks about 4%, which means that um, if um, you, when you make something, you can expect it to be about the same size as it was when you rendered it. And, um, you know, it just moves a lot less. So I ha if I have a piece that, if I have a person doing this um, with earthenware, it might end up like this. With porcelain, it Got it. this. Uh. <laughs> um, <laughs> porcelain shrinks 18 to 22%. Um, in the kiln. So if you make something that's 20 inches, well, then it comes out and it's 50 and you're like, where's the rest of it? So uh, um, <laughs> okay. um, th those technical considerations are what brought me to earthenware. Okay, that is really, really good to know. <laughs> um, and I'm just trying to think, you know, before we go into there, also, I, be before we go into looking at the images, I'm really interested in the iconography that you refer to. Um, so no, we, 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 t we talked about, you know, these luxury items with, you know, the, the luxury items with the, um, you know, with the, the porcelain um, that, that, that you're referencing. Um, but you also reference a lot of pop culture, a lot of emojis and, um, you know, and, and, and kind of this tongue in cheek aesthetic at, at some point, if, points if I might. Um, can, can you talk a, a little bit about that? I mean, you did say in your in your bio that you're a millennial, but you know, what why why this choice of these of these um, 
like emoji faces sometimes or 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 symbols emojis get us straight to the expression of emotion and um, I've never really been interested in rendering faces other than my own <laughs> in my work, um, <laughs> which I only include, well, I think you're going to talk about that later, but um, I include those as a way to put myself into the work and uh, make it a very literal self-portrait. But um, the emojis are one, a universal language, and um, I really like the economy of them as a way to access emotion. It's uh, You have a few simple dots and lines that create gestures that index to emotions that we all experience, which is why everybody uses emojis. Um, and even when you don't want to like respond to somebody with, because they sent you something too complex or you don't really want to talk to them, you can just send them some emojis and they know that you're not really trying to talk to them after that, but also <laughs> like it still says everything that you're trying to say or nothing, which maybe is the point. But emojis um, for me are very millennial. Um, they're absolutely of my generation because, you know, uh, the, the, I was going to call them boomers, uh, baby boomer, <laughs> the boomer, the baby, the baby boomer generation <laughs> rolls their eyes when they send them emojis. It's like, oh God, like you children, your emojis. I have, I have an emoji tattooed on my arm. It's like 100. Oh wow, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I keep it 100. So <laughs> it's all about, it's, it's, a, it's a cultural, it, it's immediately cultural, I would say, and immediately accessing emotion. When I got this tattoo, the tattoo artist was like, oh, I love it. It's a millennial affirmation. Yes. So yes. those ideas yes. are what goes into the work and uh, or go, go, um, goes into the work. And um, from my perspective, it, it, it challenges the formality of the work. Um, so it, it's like these, there are these forms that very much reference the, um, the kind of almost a cultural gravitas, if you will, of, um, of um, uh, as an aesthetic. But then when you throw the emojis into it, it's like, oh, <laughs> like it's not elegant to like uh you know a little almost like um crude or something or, you know there's a bit of like it's it's crass almost or some might even say it's like uh refinement and vulgarity at the same time mm -hmm. but like me so <laughs> um i but, but i've always um one way i've described myself is like well i'm um both hillary and monica so <laughs> <There you go. laughs> and when we think about those things it's um I, that that maybe is the best way to answer that question. It's a uh, it's formality and um, a bit of the the wild, aggressive, um, strange, pathological, but also immediate nature of millennial culture. And nice. a lot of the other work that I've been making recently focuses on yes, this identity politics, but a lot of just what it means to be a millennial today. Um, the social violence, the competition, the focus on. Um, perfect surface, uh, the need to be better, um, the need to be best, the need to be the baddest, whatever that means. And why do you want to be that? Well, <laughs> that's kind of just part of, a, I think it's just the nature of, of um, the culture of millennials. Here we go. Mm, for sure, for sure. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in and start sharing some images so folks can see the work. And thank you for sending these to me. Oh, you're welcome. That's awesome. <laughs> Hold on, hopefully this is the right way for me to do this. I always forget. For sure. some reason, I always forget. Okay, cool. Awesome. Um, and, you know, I think we, we definitely have to get into the role of mythology in your work, yes. which is something that I really, really appreciate um, about what you do. Um, that, you know, that there are these you know, I, I, I just think of like ancient Greek wear and, and how oftentimes the mythology would be directly on these vessels. And, you know, well, de we're definitely gonna get into how you are using vessels in your more recent work <laughs> huh? in here. But, you know, with this one, it's, I, I guess it kind of is, a, it, it is a vessel, but can you talk about this, this, you know, your, your your use of mythologies and also you know different symbolisms like you know i don't know if people could see in there like the 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 bee um that yeah. is on towards the knee <laughs> area yes absolutely the bees i'll start with that because they're on every single work um the bees are a reference to vanitas paintings um from 16th 17th century in northern europe um the Vanitas paintings, of, for those who aren't familiar, are about the idea of memento mori, or remember you will die. Um, they're the idea of uh, both, they, they capture the idea of what life is or in the human world materially, and um, the idea that 
all of these things that we collect, that we strive to have um, as humans engaged in a capitalist system um, that's grounded in materiality um, and material possessions um, will stay in this world even after we die. So the paintings are all devoid of human beings, but um, there are bees in the pictures and flies and flowers and then beetles. Basically everything that's not a bee represents death um, or demons or something related to um, the underworld. And bees represent the opposite, life, growth, um, um, resurrection, um, reproduction, and then butterflies represent the passage of time and passage of souls across realms. Mm. But um, I, I only have a butterfly once and it's not for that purpose, but um, <laughs> <laughs> the, so that's, that's bees and you'll see them on everything. That's about my own existential concerns around the fact that yes, I will die. And that's something I think about a lot. The passage of time is most, is, is most, um, um, I would say paramount in my thinking all, all day. Um, and so the bees, the bees are, are, are really on everything because of that. And I think that's also a very millennial concern. We're always, I, I think, thinking about the fact that, oh, like the world might end, like, huh, okay, well, <laughs> now what? <laughs> Who knows how much time we have? And so that's part of that. Um, to get into Greek mythology, and it is, all, uh, it is always Greek mythology. I don't really act, you, use the um, stories of any other culture. Uh, but Greek mythology and Greek culture, from my perspective, are one of the base elements of our culture today. Um, you know, why do we have democracy and the Senate and things like that? Mm -hmm. Well, it all comes from there. Um, but those um, those, mytholo those those myths are all, again, universal stories of human condition, human nature at play, um, human social dynamics at play, and they're also just canonical narratives that. Really, um, I think everybody understands to an extent, or they've heard of it, they have the general idea. Um, and the imagery is just so powerful and beautiful. It's also been used from the Renaissance to the present, or actually the ancient period to the present, um, in ways that have always told people, they've told us about ourselves in a way. Uh, this, is, this is how we act. This is um, that, you know, that's what jealousy looks like, or that, um, mm. that's what, um, um, a desire looks like, or that's what um, hubris looks like. And so those, while those stories uh, take form in art, um, I wanted to bring them into the contemporary with, uh, in my own experience. So the image that you have here is called Achilles. Um, it's about the white hand dipping me into um, the kind of metaphorical river of sticks. But uh, the white hand is my Japanese mother's white hand and the black baby's leg is mine. And the gold is a river of privilege, uh, you know, being dipped into uh, uh, or born into a world where it's like you have education, you have access, um, you know, you, you um, while I grew up with some scarcity, it, it wasn't, uh, you know, I, I, there was the idea of having enough. And so, mm -hmm. uh, or American privilege, even on its own, by just by nature of living here um, or being in the West. So when I think about all of those things, the Achilles heel is still the fact that I'm black. Um, I think often about the Harvard professor who was arrested for walking into his own house or trying to. Um, and that's that. He's, his Achilles heel is his blackness, regardless mm -hmm. of the fact that he, uh, whether he was dipped into privilege from birth or not, um, he certainly lives that by being a Harvard professor. Average salary is 218000 So. <laughs> <laughs> Come on with the facts. I love facts. <laughs> um, <laughs> love trivia too. Um, but yes. When I think about those things, um, it, we see it everywhere. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, it doesn't matter um, what you have or what you know or what school you went to. It's like, I could be easily killed any day and it would be socially okay. Wow, wow. And, and so, so this privilege actually, you know, serves as the, the power, the invincibility that, uh, that, that, that Achilles had, except for in that little tiny spot of his heel. Yes. Um, that that's that's a that's a you know potent reminder <laughs> to to kind of remember you know what what we're contending with in society. I love this piece, um, by the Thank way. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, can can I add this to my collection, please? <laughs> I love it, and it's it's it's, it's a collection. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's already in one. Dang. Um, you know, it's it's it's. Uh, I I just I just think there's an elegance to this form. There's a simplicity, but yeah, it says so much, and that that's a that's a piece 
of several of your uh, of the works that that you create um <laughs> that i really appreciate and then on the other then, then you've got the other side as, as you say <laughs> there's the <laughs> there's there's the two sides of alex um and you know another side has a little bit of a, a, a touch of excess going on it yeah. but also in a very elegant way as well um so yeah let's like just jump into one of these pieces <laughs> <laughs> This is called Losing Face, um, and it has this kind of Baroque frame, and I wanted it to access, um, one, the, the Baroque frame is um, white Western context um, and white Western formality. So when the frames that I use are often, um, they're, they're both aesthetic, but also they're literal conceptual devices. Um, within this context, I am um, this thing. And so um, we, there's an emoji reference here too, the sweat drop, the anxiety, um, the black background is painted um, to reflect the aesthetic of Japanese and Chinese uh, um, ink painting. So there's the element of um, that, that piece of my background. And then losing face is actually an Asian expression. Uh, it comes from Chinese um, and the idea of face is like who you are. Um, but mm. we, there are a few idioms that we've taken in the West um, and claimed as ours that actually came from China. But um, when we think about those things, the idea of losing face, well, um, when, I'm, when my literal white mask comes off and that's what this is, um, which is a cast of my own face, um, when that literal mask comes off, this is what's under it. You know, when you say something that's, uh, for lack of a better um, uh, a term, too black um, mm. or uh, too Asian or too gay for whatever the, uh, the context is uh, for those in-group members and, you know, actively being an out-group member, um, it, that's how you, for, from, that's how I feel. It's like, oh, oh, I said that. Oops. Oh, oh no, I, I broke my, my cover. You're seeing that I'm not like you, even though you saw that immediately, but maybe you thought that I was able to assimilate such that, um, you know, at least you can uh, not be entirely uncomfortable by my difference. Um, I often think of the, you know, words like professionalism as being um, the practice of making white people comfortable. So mm. um, it's, you know, when you break your, you, that was unprofessional when you, Said that thing or that was um that was not appropriate for and it was like I, all i said was like something that was related to black culture or something like that and whether people say it or not you see how they react and then you start to feel those ways and so then i'm always it, that this is the the experience of that anxiety mm. so it's, it's 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 kind of that that basically that moment where uh oh you forgot you were in a mixed company and you didn't code switch and <laughs> <laughs> about absolutely <laughs> yeah it's 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 like oops um and you know there's 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 this face there's a specter in this and it, it almost feels like it's a it's it's a black mirror um you know if i might say that huh? um, clearly a black mirror <laughs> okay okay awesome because i mean that, that that's what i see even though it's not shiny just that that form just i imagine a mirror to be in there and so then there's this there's this this figure um and you know in the background with the red lips that um we can recognize um this 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 stereotypical image um and yeah can you can, can, can you kind of talk about that is 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 that is that like literally this mirror it you know reminds me of like the carrie james marshall piece where where the black figure is emerging and all you see is the teeth and the eyes um, oh I, lo that's, I love that and it uses uh, it's my favorite one actually because he has the two fingers like teeth the nails, yes it's the best oh, my god i look at that all the time um <laughs> the um yes so the use of the blackface minstrel character is an analog for blackness it's about how i feel um that i'm perceived i um i'm like Oh, little black boy makes imperial porcelains. Well, I am the little black boy, and often when I uh, when people see uh, me or treat me a certain way, I feel like it comes from their understanding of me as that character. So it's not that I and, and I want to be clear about this because uh, this is something that's come up um, as a negative sometimes. And somebody was recently in my DMs really aggressively um, oh. and talking about how you know it's it's. Um, inherently colorist to use these images and i was like well your terminology is wrong but um <laughs> also um you know there's the idea that um 
you know, black people are profiting off of using um, uh, stereotypical images and subscribing to the white system in order to do that. No, um, it's actually um, a reflection of my own experience. And so um, I'm glad you asked that because that's something that's come up before, but I, you know, since, um, since we have an audience now, now there's, uh, hopefully I can offer some clarity around that. There, yes, there, um, the art world is a primarily white audience. It is the mm -hmm. white art world. Um, when we say the art world, that's what we're talking about. Not, you know, um, the the exchange of like of valuable ink paintings in in um, in Asia or you know um, things that things that don't fall within the um, kind of larger category of Art Basel. You know, um, so when we think about those things. Um, Yes, it is. It, a white audience consumes it. It's not for a white audience or for anybody necessarily. It's um, first, it's for me um, and how I express myself um, and my worldview and my lived experience um, as a person with my identity politics. There's also the element of, well, it's not for white people to, explicitly, but if it were, I've uh, said before that art is the practice of expressing the priorities of the ruling class. Well. Um, don't we think that that audience is interested in their own supremacy? When I think mm. about when people um, are like, oh, I, I don't know why I like this and when they're not somebody of my background. I'm like, mm, I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so uh, yeah, 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 I love that. I mean, you know, there, there, there's always the, the, the question of, you know, your, your work is, is primarily for, for the market. I mean, you're, you're, you know, you're represented by a gallery. So I always just, you know, kind of wonder like who is your the audience of of an artist, and you know, as as you're creating it, I love that you're saying that. You know, I'm making this primarily for myself. As as you're putting together this kind of image, it, it sounds like you are also thinking about that that end consumer who may be you know the the person who purchases this work, and so you're also simultaneously in dialogue with them and in, in, in a very Kind of in your face unapologetic way of, yeah. of let's let's contend with these histories and these these powers of privilege absolutely i i prefer for the work to be literal and and straightforward um but while we're often taught to be occlusive or to use as few signifiers as possible i think that you can create mm -hmm broader, at least I like to create broader complexity by having more signifiers and being really direct. These things mean these things, mm -hmm. of course. But then what do they mean when um, they're in context or combination with one another? What does it mean to have the black face under the mask painted in an East Asian style um, rather than just like, you know, I could write it out and, and write a paragraph that says like, this is what it feels like, but I don't. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, a, it's, I think that there's a complexity to, um, expressing human experience that only images can access. You can have all the words for what it is um, as a description and maybe even analysis, but the emotional experience of it all um, is something that words don't immediately give every person because everybody can read something differently the way that everybody can feel something different when they look at an image. But um, that image still speaks to, um, I think, and offers the subjectivity that concrete language that is less flexible or slippery, as we say in art, mm -hmm. um, uh, can give us. That's that's awesome. I love that. Um, and uh oh, I went backwards. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, another one of my absolute favorite pieces. I love this piece. Um, you know, and we, we didn't. We will talk about. I well, I guess I could just jump in. Your use of color. P this this pink is is this recurring theme in your work and. Um, you know, definitely some of the next images that we have are of the installations and you you have as as part of your artistic languages, you have these colors that you go back and forth with. I, I, I've kind of noticed by looking at them. Pink is is often recurring white, black, and then sometimes it's blue, you know, kind of as the dominant colors. There's other colors for sure. Um, Always. What's, what's this? And the gold, for sure. And the gold. And the gold. Yes, I can't forget the gold. Can't forget the gold. <laughs> yeah. What's is 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 there is there another meaning before we get into this piece? Is, is there you know, in, in all of its elements, you know, what what does this pink represent? Yeah. Um, really, two things. Um, millennial pink. That's a thing. Um, it's a color oh. that was. Um, it was kind of 
coined as being millennial pink just because of it just became popular i, I looked into this like why is it called millennial pink it's like basically because millennials like it <laughs> wow uh, and like okay cool and I, I like it too and i'm a millennial so i guess you're right but <laughs> um the it, it's been called millennial pink so it it um it is about um it's it's using a color that immediately accesses a generational experience but um it's also um it's very camp you know, it, which I think gets to the, the larger experience of um, any kind of non-straight identity politics. Um, and there's the opulence, there's the, um, there's the kind of extension of um, almost imperial culture in a way. Um, if we look at those, like everybody's in a fabulous house wearing these clothes that, like, you know, all of these extensions of like French luxury basically mm. uh, that, you know, or early American nouveau riche kind of um, um, things that turn into camp humor ultimately, but also camp aesthetics. And so, and also all of those things go into gay culture, drag culture, like anything that acts, that, that accesses kind of the queer experience. And so I don't like the word queer. I say it just because the art world says it, but um, I, I always think of it as like, well, queer actually just means strange and nothing about mm -hmm. being gay is strange. So um, no, but um, when I think about those ideas, uh, it, it's about, it's about accessing those two spaces. And I, I just think it's really beautiful. I love, I love the color pink, um, this color of pink. That's awesome. I didn't know that there was this, I guess, cause I'm Gen X. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't know that there was, there was a such thing as millennial pink. Thank you for that knowledge. Oh, um, you know, <laughs> the more you know, right? So this, I mean, I mean, this piece is, this is, this is a, you know, kind of a take on narcissist, but uh, this this narcissist is uh, very not uh, very dead. <laughs> and, very dead. You know that, yeah. And there's there's all these these other things that that pop up these these hearts. Um, you know, as as the base of the reflecting pool, and you know this gilded snake. I'm I'm really curious about this about this story because you know I can just appreciate the aesthetics of this piece. It's beautiful as is you know i'm like I, I want to own it because it's beautiful um it's but beautiful. you know again what's that <laughs> can't do it right i'm gonna have to buy it from, <laughs> from the collector but <laughs> but you know there, there there's there's all these other stories um that that feel personal and you know that i feel like i might be able to access from my own you know from from my own stories um i want to hear about it I want to hear about it from your perspective. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. I, I, this is actually one of my favorite pieces, and um, it's the figure is life size here. I don't think the the photo doesn't oh, quite yeah. tell that. I'm I'm a really small person, so it's life size for me. But either way, it's like big for Clay. Um, so, <laughs> but when I made my last solo show, which opened this year in January, it, it's called the Gazing Pool, and the Gazing Pool is what Narcissus is looking into here. But it's about the narcissistic um, kind of ethos of, of, of millennials. Everything is about me. Um, everything is about like my surface, my followers on Instagram, my clothes, my, my, my happiness, my, my self-care, you know, all of those things that everybody, you know, the millennials love to talk about. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not saying this with any kind of disdain, despite my tone. Of, <laughs> too. So I'm like, oh, here we are doing that thing that we do. Okay, well, I like it. Here we are. So, <laughs> um, and it's true. But um, the core of narcissism, there are, I, I've read about like, what, like 10 books on this lately. <laughs> so I'm really like, wow. it's a deep research in, uh, interest for me. Um, 11 books, actually. Um, and so I, a few pieces of, um, Kind of narcissism that this accesses are one um narcissism comes from trauma early on or the lack of something um it can be a lot of things but usually it's the lack of attention um mm. or a denial of your personhood and um or or being told that you know your interests or um your um I guess this is extension of or ex explanation of what denial of your personhood could be, but it's saying that uh, when your parents or your environment says what you are is not right or good, the things that you want or the things that you're interested in or the things that you think about are not right or good and, that, and, and should be changed or erased at a minimum. Um, one of my favorite books that I read was called Narcissist, Denial of the True Self. Uh, narcissism, mm -hmm. Denial of the True Self. And that's, I think a lot of that has to do with millennial culture because 
Um, we, uh, one major difference that we had from the last generation is um, no parents stay home anymore. And I don't think of that as a negative. It's just a reality of things. My, my mother worked. I, I, I think that's, I, I support that fully. It's not, a, mm -hmm. it's not a statement about um, judgment or anything like that or value judgment. It's just, it is what it is. And so um, we don't have, we didn't get as much attention as they got. Um, so we're taking it for ourselves. Uh, there's also within that, um, if, with that as a basis, well, who gets the most attention? And then people mm -hmm. compete for that. Um, I, I'm hotter, uh, my clothes look better, they fit better, this is Gucci, you know, whatever it is, um, those things all go into that. And so another piece of narcissism is uh, the fact that your body becomes an extension um, of your mind. It becomes a vessel to execute um, the will of your mind rather than there being a somatic drive, it's purely mental. So um, it's not about what feels good or what's right or wrong. It's like, what does my head say um, that we have to do right now? And then that's what will happen. And so this is about that mind-body separation, not Descartes' mind-body separation, but the idea of the literal uh, separation between um, two things that should be merged. And here, the figure is, or th two things that should work together um, in order to be a person. Um, mm -hmm. Millennials don't really live their personhood. We do a lot of things that are fun. Um, but we also do a lot of things that we just have to do, which is also self-imposed. Mm -hmm. Why do we have to compete? Because I'm a millennial and I'm American. And I want to do these <laughs> things. That, you know, and he thinks I'm cute. And then, okay, cool, fine. You subscribe then. Now we have to do these things. Um, so um, unless you want to be entirely acultural, that's just how it is. And so um, there's a lot of pathos in that. Um, but when we look in, in this, there are symbols like um, these are both you know, blood drops from the head being severed, but they also mm -hmm. are the same as the teardrop. And there's that connection between the two. It's blood and tears. Um, and I'm not trying to get into the of blood, sweat and tears, but <laughs> it's, uh, that pain, I think that's attached to it, you know, crying because um, one, because the head was cut off is the, the, the immediate obvious thing, but crying because, well, even before the head was cut off, it was never really attached mm. um, uh, psychologically and somatically. So there's that that element of just pain as part of it. And then this is a reference to the um, Venus de Milo, of course, no arms. Um, getting into classical aesthetics, again, as the basis of uh, Western culture. The snakes are always a symbol of deceit, danger, um, uh, you know, in, um, terror. Um, it's, uh, and so with that, there's the idea of looking into the gazing pool and one, seeing these things, seeing yourself, the headless figure looks in, the head itself looks in and cries into the pool. It tells us that the pool is actually a pool of tears. But also um, when we look at this, we see that um, the fact that uh, the action of looking is also a dangerous thing. The action mm -hmm. of being trapped within one's reflection and obsessed with it is, is where the danger lies rather than, uh, you know, just the fact that uh, um, the pool is, is this kind of charged thing. Wow, that is deep. That is <laughs> so deep. <laughs> I, you know, here we are. <laughs> I, I do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I just, I just really appreciate the, you know, the philosophy, the research, the, the deep thinking that that um, you inject into your work. You know, everything has a purpose. It's tying to, um, you know, these these larger you know, thoughts and, and um, investigations that, that you're embarking upon, um, you know, that, that's exciting. And kind of with that said, I want to talk about your, your installations. Yeah. Um, you know, I kind of talked about the pink and the pink is ultra prevalent here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think, you know, there, there's this specific manner in which you display your work. Um, you know, the, these easily could just, I don't know, some of them could be sitting on the floor or they all could just be on one large surface, but, um, you know, you've got them on these individual pedestals and, you know, kind of like as we, I'm going to kind of jump through a couple of them and we can, and we can circle back, but there is a very specific manner in which you arrange them um, within the within the gallery space, which I think also kind of creates um, this isn't the gallery organizing. What I understand is this is how you have dictated that these pieces are arranged. Um, and you know, as as a viewer entering the space, um, as a visitor, there's a specific 
set of paths that you can take as you're navigating, mm -hmm. as you're navigating um, some of these spaces. Um, and then even your, your choice to paint the walls in certain circumstances or with the, with the curtains to bring this very large area of color. And I want to know all about, you know, <laughs> this because it, I almost certainly, as, as I could tell, you know, from how you described the last piece, um, is speaking to a much larger narrative. Yeah, the format for the um, the placement of the works often follows, at least in the last, um, well, the shows, actually all of my recent shows in the last few years, um, it follows a processional format. Like you're walking through this and it's taking you through a set of experiences. I've described the work before as um, being an instantiated approach, approach to making meaning where each object is an instance of, um, of emotion. You're looking at this and or, or emotion or um, a social observation. Uh, for example, emotion would be more this piece in the back. Um, it's, a, it's a rabbit that's um, eating snakes when the rabbit itself was supposed mm. to be eaten by snakes. So there's kind of the feeling of, of triumph and also of the role reversal of predator and prey to prey predating on predator. But um, the uh, a more uh, uh, social experience is about th like this piece. This, this is called Stop Hooning. Um, it's a raccoon that's being <laughs> um, attacked by laser eyes, but it also has this uh, a reference to uh, uh, St. Teresa and ecstasy in the Cornaro Chapel. So um, if you know the piece. So there's the, it's, it's central, it's large. And so everything else kind of flanks it in a way where you're mm. like, you look at this and it's contextualized by these things. Everything is an image. And I think that's, I, I, maybe it's a, an extension or a stretch, but I think of this at least, um, for myself, um, there's a millennial obsession with images also and Instagram kind of things where it's like the front, you're looking at something and you get all of it. And so everything mm -hmm. is um, as a contained context for itself, but the other works around it create context for everything else that they share space with. So this is contextualized by this and this and this and this by this and this and this. So all of the, it's, it's all symbiotic. There's also the idea of um, capturing a kind of Beaux-Arts format um, Beaux-Arts aesthetics and architecture and urban planning are um, products of 19th century Europe, um, and so are we. So when we think about those things, um, it is the literal structure of the white Western power structure. And so um, it follows um, the aesthetics of uh, uh, European Western museums, which were often usually pa uh, previously palaces, which again mm. are those uh, bastions of white Western power. And so when we were looking at these things as um, the little black boy making imperial porcelains or even the gazing pool that has um, uh, a format that forces you to walk in, it's the, it's the image that has- uh, I think this one, right? Yes, this one. Yeah, this is in the Palm Beach Gallery. The last, other ones are in LA. Um, there's still that format of like a psychological space of order where you're walking in and um, I, I think about do I like these things because of how I've been conditioned, um, this format? Because I also like the way it looks. I think that, um, or, you know, do I like these things because um, of something inherent to me? Or, you know, is it, um, is it because I'm just like really into aesthetics and, and, and harmony and balance? But um, I think that there's also, um, there's an element of control to it. Um, and there's a formality that it creates that I think is important, especially for um, ceramics, because people, just like the way they see Black people, don't think of ceramics as being worth very much. Um, mm. or, and being contextualized as something that is um, on its own abject or um, actively inferior or, um, you know, it's craft. It's not, it couldn't possibly be in, uh, uh, engaged with theory or even thinking. Um, and so I, I want the format to complement the work as much as the, the work does for itself. Um, and also to create, um, I mean, there are these obvious things like curatorial choices, like clean lines of, of sight and, um, you know, things that are for it to look balanced. But um, even this is, obviously it's an image, but it's an image, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the format mm -hmm. is an image um, uh, of everything I want people to see on their own. Uh, um, in in the work so like when you walk in the first thing like the um the one that you had uh, before is the same kind of thing where you walk you you're looking that's uh one more okay yeah yeah that's that's like from 
that's in the middle of the gallery, but you're facing from the front door. Um, and you're, you're looking at this whole processional. Um, and in other images, I've had it be a processional where you walk through moments of life to an ultimate end. Uh, my MFA thesis was like this, a movement from stereotype threat to kind of a, a becoming um, part of the white system. And then um, this video of uh, a work kind of disintegrating water. It's like ultimate mm -hmm. life. Um, so as you're moving toward these things, you try to, you know, do what you can in America and then die. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's that. Uh, the format is, it, um, it is, is conceptual and, and want, I want it to relate to and support the objects. Um, it's, it's not, there's a, there are aesthetic choices, but I, I've always, I don't know, I'm, I'm I, I, try, I don't, I try not to be critical of other works that I see, but um, when I see that the format doesn't feel considered, I'm like, well, it's not done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That totally makes sense. Um, you know, and there, there, there's so so again, where you're going into, you know, going back to this, the the stop cooning piece, which I <laughs> freaking love on so many things. Again, you know, a millennial term. Um, I mean, it's millennials didn't make it up, but um, you know, it's, it's been it's, around. It's, like, I mean, it's, our it's, parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 been around for quite some time right now, but you know, definitely is is a is a terminology that um has made a resurgence. Um yeah. so so you know you you've you've got that his you've got that constant time context. You talked about um the rapture is it the rapture of Saint Teresa? Is that uh, uh the ecstasy of Saint Teresa? The ecstasy. Okay, the ecstasy. Um, and then you've got this, 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 this head shooting lasers out. So it's, a, it's almost like this anime pop camp, culture kind of, I, I described it as, uh, camp violence, camp <laughs> violence. And like, then, yeah, I, I, violence, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> old and then I, violence. Yeah. Like what today is also asking and, and, you know, I started to pick up that also is like, are, are those calorie shells on that? Oh, that no, are those framing? But I, I see that, that. That would have made sense, but no, I have never, I've never <laughs> used power shell as an image. No, um, it's more or less just leaves. <laughs> leaves. Okay. 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 So yeah, it's it, this, this, this combination of all these elements is, um, super interesting to me with, with, with your work. Um, and we're starting to run out of time. See, that's why I wanted to start right away. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> the audience members, please uh, drop in your questions in the Q and a panel, um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the icon. If you're on Facebook, just type it into the comments and um, we'll bring it over. Um, so I want to talk about a few more pieces before we jump away. Um, and I guess I get to just kind of pick some that I especially love <laughs> that, that I'm imagining are already in someone's collection. But <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this this one is just really beautiful. But I think again, it pull. I think it pulls in those elements. I love, you know, knowing that the the hand and the head are are cast directly from you so you've got yourself in this piece um and yeah there there's 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 just something just very um i don't know that there, there's something about this piece that feels very high end and i and you know something about the gold chain also um makes me feel like like high end fashion connected <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, it, it does this, I always think the work is like Valentino, Gucci, and then mm -hmm. like, um, maybe like, I mean, I don't like, I, I don't want to put this out there too, don't, don't apply this too heavily, but like Betsy Johnson sometimes, like with the ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Like, um, you know, like this especially, but um yeah very gucci which is very millennial um and the focus on opulence you know it's it's like um crying figure trying to escape from the gazing pool but make it beautiful make it cute make it gay yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, so it's it's um it, it is about that luxury but it's also about like you know there's a broken chain um it's yeah at the, at the end of the upper the upper mm -hmm. the upper left it's broken so it's like um you know, the, the reflection was under the water, broke free of that, and then, you know, floats to the top. There are bubbles also, like, you know, to suggest floating. But um, it's like, what if you were actually able to leave 
that. And so in my studies of narcissism, I've been able to check myself a little bit as well, where I'm like, oh, I do that. That's bad. Okay, well, let's not. <laughs> so like the more I learn about the things that are pathological or negative or socially violent or harmful to other people or myself, um, I think of myself as, you know, developing that awareness to free myself from those things. And so the chains are really personal. Um, mm. It's about freeing yourself from yourself or from your uh, dispositional circumstances and conditioning. And then, um, you know, it starts to be a little more free. You're just, it's, this is just, this is called escape from the gazing pool. It starts to be, um, you get to start to be a person. Wow. That's, that's awesome. Oh, somebody already has it. Can't get it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and I think, you know, definitely, I, I, I feel like this would be um, a misstep for me if I didn't um, highlight some of these vessels. And I, and I understand, you know, that you started off creating vessels uh, yes. in, in high school ceramics, and now you've um, circled back to creating um, these vessels, but using them kind, kind of more as a canvas mm -hmm. um, for, for painting. And I'm really curious about that move. Yeah, I always include at least one vessel, but you, at, so far it's been two vessels in uh, every show because people look at the work and they don't associate it with what uh, with ceramics, they don't think it looks like clay. Um, it's not, it's not um, de-skilled. It's not um, crunchy, crusty, lumpy, <laughs> not even that shiny really often. You know, the, the only shiny thing is gold. It doesn't look like the clay that we're used to seeing in, um, based on what the canon has shown us over the last hundred or, you know, 3000 years even. Um, so I always put a vessel in to remind them, it's like, this is clay. Um, one of my goals beyond expressing myself or creating a position for people um, like me um, who have this lived experience is also pushing ceramics forward as a medium. And so um, I want to be able to show the, the breadth um, of possibilities that the medium offers. Yes, of course, you can make a vessel. Good to know. Um, but also like all these other things. But look, they're the same material. This is the same white earthenware um, that the uh, the sculptures are made of. And it's important to me to be able to challenge the paradigm and challenge the position of ceramics um, within that paradigm because painting is at the top. Oil painting is at the top. Ceramics mm -hmm. is really low. Um, when you make a painting on a ceramic vessel, you can't say it's not a painting. Um, and I make ceramic paintings as well. Thus, you can't say they're not paintings, but they're still made of clay. So then it conflates that those two opposing positions and really it negates those two opposing positions. Mm. Have, um, you know, you're, oh, it's just an artwork. Oh, weird, it's just an artwork, fancy that. I've been saying that forever. Now you, now you know. So <laughs> um, <laughs> now you agree, cool. Um, or you, at least you can't, you can't say it's not. So um, that's what they're about. But um, vessels also have always had um, a secondary purpose beyond containment as uh, storytelling devices, narrative mm. devices. And so I wanted to access that original position as well. If you look at this um, in the center, that red is also a 100 emoji and those are heart emojis around it. So um, uh. Uh, ink painting aesthetics and techniques, but also uh, imagery from millennial culture um, and life. Okay, and then also these, these uh... These these menstrual show faces um, and and this one with the with the X's for the eyes. Um, yeah. So 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 it's almost like a blending of 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 that with an emoji. Um, and what you know what do what do these what what do these represent? Because it, it seems like they 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 kind of have morphed over time. And there's these little blue ones happening yeah. here as well. <laughs> it's like it's a lot of ghosts. Um, you know, there are bones on the ground. Um, I like to make I. I was thinking about uh, several years ago, I was like, this work, I, I, I just made a lot of pretty things, you know, flowers and stuff. And I was like, this is so saccharine. It's not really <laughs> to, like um, the violence that I see in the world or like the dualities that um, make up, you know, my complex personhood like everybody has. Um, and so I, I wanted to start to get to that like playful yet, um, dark and maybe even sinister elements of, of what life is. It's, it's like, a, I think of life as being a sick game. Um, and it's like, oh God, really? Okay, well, surprise, here we are. Like some awful things happen, something happens and you're like, okay, yep, yep, okay, that makes sense, yeah, okay. And so um, there's a lot of that. Um, America's built on black death um, and or non-white death in general. Um, death is part of, I, I think there's a human um, uh, propensity for violence. Mm -hmm. um, that's natural, uh, whether we like it or not. And, you know, it's, it's um, cultured out of us, which is great. Um, but 
Um, I think there's also that like, you know, why don't like, why are we able to kill? You know, it's like, that's, I think that's part of it. Um, and so, or, or, you know, why do we die all the time? And uh, what, what will kill us? Well, everything will kill us. And so I think about um, those ideas, but then there's also like, it, it's bringing it back into the context of race. Um, and there's also this like, oh, you're happy because you're dead. Like you're happy because you turned off your, your personhood. Like you let, your, mm. you let that die and that's why you're good. Be smiling. The one that's not dead is kind of like, oh, here we go, another one, all right. Um, so <laughs> are like, um, they're both spirits. Um, they're spirits, they're minstrel characters. Um, they're ghosts um, of like people in general who are just kind of like around and you know not really living, which I think is also generally applicable. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think about, I, I, I worked in corporate roles once and you get up at the same time every day and go to sleep at the same time every day. And then you go do the same things every day. It feels like its own kind of death. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, being alive on autopilot as a zombie, well, if you're not dead, you're undead if you're a zombie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh oh, how did I end up back here? <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna go through one go go to one more piece um, before you know opening up to final questions and closing. Um, but yeah, I also you know I just, just kind of wanted to point to with this piece, the entire structure is ceramic, right? This yeah. is this is not canvas with a ceramic frame. Correct. This is all ceramic. Okay. It's all attached. Um, it's not made in separate parts and then attached. Everything it goes from um wet clay to fired to glazed um and eventually with uh application of gold so it's all it's all entirely ceramic materials and not done a, it's and with traditional approaches it's like not like made in little parts and then put together people ask me that no <laughs> got it got it um and you know so so you 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 already spoke about that so yeah, I just wanted to. Uh, you already you already spoke about you know why you're blending the the painting with um, with the ceramics. Um, so yeah, I also kind of want to. Can can you talk a little bit more about your process? Um, yeah, this like is... I, yeah, I just I just want to know like are you are you someone who like do you sketch everything out? No. <laughs> <laughs> I my process is about seeing visual metaphors for life and remembering them and then putting them into form. Um, it's like seeing uh, um, something in nature um, or something in everyday life that indexes to or serves as an allegory for a social situation that could be tied to identity politics or just human di uh, social dynamics. But um, if you see, I always use this example, so I was going to try not to try to avoid it, but I've, I've said it a few times, but it always, it's the one that makes the most sense to me is like when I was, and I'll, I'll go quickly, but what, um, when I was growing up, I saw a fly in a spider web and I pulled the fly out and it lost a leg in the spider web. And I was like freaked out because I was like six. But like for me, it's like, well, have you ever got involved in a situation trying to make it better and you only made it worse? So, things mm. like that. so visual metaphors for social uh, uh, situations or visual metaphors for um, just the experience of human life. When I see things um, or think of something or, oh, that's like that, this is like this, the way that this is like this, which is called metalipses um, in art. Um, there's, <laughs> oh, am I doing too much? <laughs> no, 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 I love it, I love it. Never heard of that before. Metalipses is if you had, um, if you have an image of Napoleon in, um, in the same image as um, like a, um, a really, really tiny lion that's taking over um, the the whole plane, because um, the two relate, but they're in the same picture. Um, Got it. Like okay. Like, this is like this. When this is like this. Um, so things like that um, that come into the work, and 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 in my own experience of life, I'm like, oh, that that reminds me of this. Or I'll hear something in a song. Um, I listen to like I really only listen to like really ratchet rap music, and a lot of <laughs> <laughs> vibrant images, though. I mean, like. Um, 21 Savage, like everything he says, I'm like, oh, wow, it, it makes, yeah, actually, yes, yeah, sure. Um, and so, you know, some of those images um, trigger things in me where I'm like, oh, yeah, that's like this, the way that that's like this. And so then you can connect um, the, the combination of images to complex social or personal or um, universally human um, aspects of the human condition. Wow, wow. <laughs> 
<laughs> that is awesome. I am. <laughs> Yeah, Metalipsis, right? Think right today. I'm like, what? That is so cool. Um, I'm gonna start using that one for Use sure. It. It's great. <laughs> yeah. I also wanted to talk to you about, you know, influences. Which which artists have been, you know, the sources of greatest inspiration for you? Yeah. Um, ceramic, the ceramic canon, of course. Um, you know, I we wouldn't be here making these things or even having um, a space for works made of clay without them. My professor, Adrian Sachs, um, was um, a major influence. Um, Barbara Kruger, um, major influence, all social. Um, and she was one of my professors at UCLA as well. So that mm. was, um, and there was always that, what, what she told me before my work was, your, um, your work is overdetermined. Um, so I was <laughs> Huh. And so I was like, that that was actually really helpful because I it freed me a bit from my own need to be like, this means this and this means this. Um, but the way that she approaches social situations um, in work or social dynamics or social truths based on identity politics was, um, I mean, it is brilliant. And it, it's really, um, it was a major inspiration. I look at works by artists like, like uh, Robert Nava um, and people are like, why do you... I love mm -hmm. Robert Nava. People are like, why do you like that? And I'm like, <laughs> it's very different from what you make. Or it, and it's like, it looks really fast and you're not fast. And I was like, it's, it's so free. It's so uninhibited. If you want to make a mark mm -hmm. on something that speaks to um, how you're feeling, rendering is information and content as much as, um, as the actual content or imagery itself. Uh, rendering makes the image and, show, and tells us how to feel about it. Um, so things like that. Um, there are a lot of contemporary artists that I'm um, influenced by. Um, and I've, I've been drawn to, I mean, it's, oh, um, like Murakami, of course, is an immediate, obvious one cause. I mean, everybody. Yes, thought, yes, yes. But I'm like, I make characters and he makes characters and those characters are emotional. Um, and if you're, if you're willing to um, look past the immediate commercial element, which is only a thing because they're so good. Um, <laughs> oh, it is what I say. Like, oh, well, cause is just commercial. I'm like, yeah, because it's great. Like, and they're mm -hmm. like, no, because someone put him on. No, because they put, they put him on because it's great. Because he's great. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cause they're meaningful because they speak to how, um, how we are, you know, how we think, how we feel, how we interact. Um, it, a brilliant use of and really effective use of gesture always to tell a story without any other signifiers. Um, things like that, um, that, that use gesture to tell us um, an entire narrative. Um, oh, shoot, it's, it's 2.13 and I totally okay. forgot you, you, you had some pieces you were gonna show us. Oh, sure, yeah. Can, 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 can we do that just like real, real quick before we end? Yeah, let me turn <laughs> off my background, uh, okay. <laughs> So this is one, um, I hope it will get, I hope that it will pick up on the screen, but speaking of gesture. <laughs> we, we can, we can, is, it, is that like a hand? It's is a it, hand, it's a hand like, with nails? Like that. Yes, yes. <laughs> so it's a gesture of kind of like, you know, being sweet, slick and shady at the same time. Um, here's the face, I think that helps more. Nice, and it is really good to see the scale also. Oh yeah, yeah. Standing this, there. It's like um, about, what, 28 inches? And then this one is called Chosen. It is, it's a hand holding a flower that then has the minstrel character at the top. And, you know, he has this kind of like, oh, uh, here I am, oh no. Um, it's that feeling of being like, you know, it, it is held by a black hand, but there's the feeling of being tokenized. And it's like, mm. oh, oh God, like now what? You've been put on this pedestal by a uh, social um, system that you didn't ask for. Um, anxiety. <laughs> now add <Yes>. anxiety. <laughs> so those are two works um, as an example. And uh, there are more on display at Gavlet Gallery. Um, there's going to be a show called Clay Pop at Jeffrey Deitch in the fall, uh, which is kind of uh, looking awesome. hand and forward at 30 ceramic artists who are um, kind of, they're all contemporary artists and then um, new people like me. So um, there's that. And then um, I know you asked about uh, things uh, Felix Art Fair in just a couple weeks at, in LA. Woohoo! Yeah. Awesome. And so, can, like, is is your is your website the best place for people to follow you and to find out what's happening? Is it Instagram? Like, what, where's where's the Instagram place to? Is probably the best, really. Um, I mean, my website is updated, but 
um, you'll get to see the newest things um, and things in progress or, you know, any updates all through Instagram. So yeah, it's 100 Alex Anderson. Thank you for putting that in the chat um, and the gallery website, but those are, they don't have everything that's new. It's, it's Instagram is it really. It's my, yeah, point. yeah. <laughs> That is awesome. That is awesome. Um, and so the the just just retract one more time. The next the nearest next exhibition is when? Uh July 29th at Felix Art Fair. Nice, nice, nice. So yeah. if any, yeah, if anyone's in the LA area at the end of the month, that's the place to be. Place that's to awesome. Be. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Alex. This has been <laughs> awesome. I appreciate you, sh you know, sharing all this knowledge with us and, you know, how deep your work is. It's, it's really amazing. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's such a pleasure to be here. And um, thank you for your thoughtful questions. Yes, yes. And if anybody, if you joined us a little bit late, this uh, conversation will immediately be available on Museum of the African Diaspora's Facebook page. Um, and then by the end of the week, you can join, you can find it on our YouTube page along with all of the past art talks. All right, Alex, have a good one. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and I look forward to meeting you in person soon. I'm to LA. I would love that. Yes, <laughs> yes, for sure. All right, have a beautiful day. You too. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you again.